I've been um, privileged to uh, work in this area both in research and in practice. Uh, for the last five years, I've served as an advisor to the Norwegian Sovereign Fund and been able to get a, uh, a practical perspective on many of these issues. It is a very under-researched area at the moment, uh, but these institutions are increasing in importance. So what is a sovereign wealth fund? Well, there is no universally accepted definition of a sovereign wealth fund. Sovereign wealth funds are part of sovereign or national savings, which include everything from central bank reserves, stabilization or commodity savings funds, pension, national pension funds or social security funds, and other government holding management companies. A working definition of uh, a sovereign wealth fund would be an investment fund controlled by governments and largely, if not wholly, invested in foreign assets. The term sovereign wealth fund was itself first coined by a gentleman, Andrew Rosanoff, who was at State Street at the time in 2005. And they've grown in importance over the past decade, uh, partly due to a number of factors which I'll go through uh, very shortly. The largest sovereign wealth funds uh, number in the uh, hundreds of billions of dollars. Uh, this data should be interpreted with a little bit of caution. These numbers come from uh, a sovereign wealth fund institute, which purports to collect data from many funds. However, many of these funds are actually extremely secretive. So uh, GIC, for example, um, has a number there, but I think if you talk to GIC, they would disclaim that number. No one actually would tell you that number officially. Uh, and even only very high level representatives at that fund actually know what that number is. That also goes for ARIA up the top and many of the other funds here. They operate in uh, not very transparent settings. Um, the largest ones um, are, uh, are, are assumed to be Abu Dhabi. Norway is, um, is, is uh, a good half a trillion dollars now. Norway's natural weight in equities worldwide is 1%. So basically all 1% of every single company uh, worldwide should actually be owned by Norway according to their current uh, weighting scheme. So these employ massive amounts of capital. And they came to attention during the financial crisis because the, well, I think a lot of the same people that decried sovereign wealth funds just a few years before were uh, exclaiming that sovereign funds could come and ride to the rescue and save our failing Western financial system. Uh, America has its own sovereign wealth fund. Uh, it's the Alaska Permanent Fund, and that's currently around $37 billion. These funds, some of them are very old. The first sovereign wealth fund was Kuwait, which was founded in 1953. Right? Um, Sama, uh, which is uh, itself actually an account, it's basically a central bank, um, was, um, depending on how you look at it, was also in the early 1950s. There is a blurring between what a sovereign wealth fund is, and what a central bank reserve fund is, and what a stabilization fund is. We actually don't have very good data, as we said, on many sovereign wealth funds. We do have very good data, though, on central bank reserves, because central bank reserves are required to be reported to the IMF, with some exceptions. And you can see that these things, these central bank reserves, um, have this very steep upward trajectory, <coughs> starting from the late 1990s going upwards and currently are over uh, $9 trillion. Currently, China and Taiwan do not report to the IMF, so you would actually have to add an additional $1.6 trillion on there just for China alone. Taiwan also holds significant foreign reserves. So there's a lot of money sitting in these institutions. So what's a central bank versus a sovereign wealth fund? Um, <clears throat> I think these sovereign wealth funds are just one vehicle for holding sovereign wealth. There is a very blurry distinction between reserves, central bank reserves, so commodity savings reserves, state-owned companies, and um, sovereign wealth funds. Certain central banks, like Switzerland, SAFE, which is the State Administration of Foreign Exchange by China, and Norway, this is not the Norwegian Sovereign Fund, it's actually the Norwegian Central Bank Reserves, those central banks actually hold equity, making them very much uh, more akin to risky investors. Certain sovereign wealth funds, on the other hand, and they would call themselves sovereign wealth funds, like Chile's Economic Stabilization Fund, Russia's Reserve Fund, hold highly liquid safe instruments, very similar to what would be traditionally thought of as central bank reserves. So the composition of these and the aims of these is really, um, is really very blurred. There is an institution, the International Forum of Sovereign Wealth Funds, and there is a uh, principle, a 24 uh, point principles, 
uh, called the Santiago Principles. And <clears throat> there are some members of these. These are voluntary membership. And there's uh, some, some basic uh, standards that these members have agreed to in terms of transparency and reporting and, uh, and actions. So these are not uh, for the whole list of funds that you would so have seen two slides earlier, but they encompass several of them. Some countries have more than one fund. For example, Singapore, GIC is a member of the IFSWF, but its counterpart, Tamasek, uh, is not. So again, uh, it depends on what you call yourself, if you are a sovereign wealth fund or not. So where did all this money come from? Well, there are three main sources of, uh, of this money. The first one is commodity prices. Petroleum prices shot up during the late 1990s. They went from US $20 during the late 1990s and reached a high of uh, $147 in 2008. And right now, currently, they're back over $100. So we looked at that list of funds two slides ago. You would have seen that many of these funds are very oil-rich um, countries. Uh, uh, Abu Dhabi, Norway, Saudi Arabia. But at the same time, there are countries here that don't have natural resources too. China, so we'll talk about those. So the second sort of uh, source of wealth for these countries has been trade surpluses. Part of the idea for these trade surpluses is really similar to the idea of holding your reserves from selling your commodities. And that is, you want to insulate the domestic econom economy from this large source of wealth. In the case of commodities, there is an effect called the Dutch disease or the natural resource curse. So very often, when you have a fortuitous discovery of a natural commodity, then that can crowd out private investment, causing you to underinvest in education. It shrinks the uh, productive sectors other than the one that's producing oil or, or copper or whatever other commodity you have. And you want to avoid that. So you want to isolate or insulate your economy from those effects. So similarly, if you have trade surpluses, your domestic economy might be ill-equipped to absorb all the inflows, or your leaders might have precautionary savings motives that they might think that these, uh, these, um, that these trade surpluses may disappear at some point in time, and the country must be prepared. Associated with these, perhaps, trade imbalances, there is a new form of thinking called the New Bretton Woods. And this is a term that was um, <coughs> that was coined by Dooley, Foucault, and Landau, uh, and Garber. And it's really about the fixed US dollar new regime that uh, was very similar to the Bretton Woods when exchange rates were fixed prior to the 1970s. The third source of wealth for these sovereign wealth funds is government budget surpluses or transfers. So some of these uh, countries, like Australia, have funded sovereign wealth funds through government surpluses. Other governments, notably Ireland, have basically issued debt and put the proceeds of that debt issue into uh, a sovereign wealth fund. That hasn't really fared so well, uh, the Irish one, because the sovereign wealth fund for Ireland was actually used, uh, or mis maybe ha perhaps misused, to bail out some uh, failing Irish financial institutions. Uh, is it global imbalances? I think uh, partly yes, but I don't think all these imbalances are bad. Uh, if you have um, found oil, and you were to not put that money aside, you would have actually had very devastating effects for your local economy. So that is definitely an imbalance, but it's actually a good thing. So perhaps some of the trade imbalances are not such a good thing, but I think it's, it's unfair to call them all an effect of global imbalances, if, and global imbalances may not be all bad. Uh, <coughs> okay. The impact of sovereign wealth funds, though, I think reflect two main um, uh, broader geopolitical trends, which are totally outside a finance talk, but we should mention them nonetheless. And the first one is the redistribution of wealth that's been ongoing for the past decade and will continue to, do, to, to, to go in this direction for the next couple of decades, away from the Western world, primarily focused on the US, Europe, and other mature developed economies, to the East, primarily, and other developing countries. The second broad trend is an increasing role of governments in managing wealth. Even the US has not been a totally free market economy. So the US itself has had some government intervention in the economy. The really relevant question is how much. In many of these nascent countries which have large increases in wealth held in sovereign wealth funds, the role of governments is much larger than the traditional role of government 
in, uh, in, the, in developed countries. So what is the role, appropriate role of governments in managing wealth, creating industrial policy, and managing the economy? So in the policy paper, I look at some benchmarks of for sovereign wealth funds, and they are different from private investment management firms. And I talk about four benchmarks grouped into these categories, legitimacy, uh, policy and liabilities, governance structure and equilibrium, uh, uh, gov governance structure and performance, sorry, and finally, long-run equilibrium. And legitimacy is by far the most important of these. Libya has a sovereign wealth fund now, but I don't think one would describe its government as being legitimate, and therefore its sovereign wealth fund is probably illegitimate as well. M most of that money in the sovereign wealth fund is now under sanctions by the US and other countries. So legitimacy is as the, the, the primary um, most important benchmark. A sovereign wealth fund, the most important thing for the sovereign wealth fund is that it be managed so that you don't touch the money today. Otherwise, you get the Dutch disease. You want to gradually disperse this money across present and future generations. To do so requires legitimacy and credibility. And there are different models for this. I don't think transparency is required at all for this. Norway is definitely transparent, as fits the social outlook of that country. But there are very successful funds like GIC and uh, Kuwait and, and Abu Dhabi, which have legitimacy, which are not transparent. And they would claim that they would not like to be transparent given the type of environment that they live in and the type of neighbors, perhaps uh, bellicose neighbors, that they face. Also, accountability and regular reporting, though, are important for these. Although these countries aren't transparent, they do have boards, they do report to governments or, mi or ministries or to parliament directly. Okay. The second benchmark is one of integrated policy and liabilities. It really recognizes the environment in which these sovereign wealth funds live and their role as only one of perhaps many policy instruments a government can take. I want to look at an example here for East Timor. East Timor is, is an incredible fund. East Timor has a population <coughs> where the G average GDP per capita is 500. Okay? We don't have any other zeros, 500 US dollars. This fund is 10 times GDP. Right? Norway, for all its wealth, half a trillion dollars worth, is approximately one times Norwegian GDP. So East Timor is a giant. It's an absolute giant. And you can think about countries like East Timor and other sets, in other settings around the world where that amount of wealth would have had severe, unfortunate consequences. And it hasn't. And one of the reasons why East Timor has been so successful is, is that it's anchored its, its fund in an array of policy measures designed to produce uh, development for the country, um, prudent financial management, and other macroeconomic uh, effects. <coughs> um, reserve or stabilization funds have now also morphed to sovereign wealth funds. So, for example, here we would think of CIC or SAFE, which have now changed their mandates really from traditional reserve funds to part of macroeconomic savings for the whole country. And so that's basically changing your liability structure or the purpose of what these funds are. Sovereign wealth funds, you eventually will want to have that money paid into the country, although gradually. So the payout rule would delineate how and when that money should be distributed. And there should be some flexibility here. Some sovereign wealth funds like Saudi Arabia and Kuwait have paid after the, uh, the Gulf Wars in reconstructing the countries. Chile also tapped its sovereign wealth fund after the earthquake in Chile. So there should be some flexibility in how this money should be used. Let me turn to the third benchmark, which is governance structure and performance. And I don't think this is a requirement for sovereign wealth funds. Uh, if a sovereign wealth fund, however, should be well managed to choose an optimal risk return trade-off, then I think governance structure and performance is, is a very important part to do that. You need professionalism. So remember, Sovereign wealth funds are owned by governments. It's not so easy for bureaucratic institutions to manage money well. Those funds that have done so, Kuwait, Singapore, Norway, are shining examples of this, have been fortunate to create professional money management cultures, either within central bank or public sector organizations. This is actually extremely challenging to do. They could have actually been traditional, very um, <coughs> stodgy, traditional bureaucratic institutions, but they haven't been so. And so they've, they've succeeded in creating a professional culture amenable to good investment decisions. The government's model and also the mandate have to be simultaneously considered. So a lot of these funds have mandates that look like something like 
a real interest rate or a real payout, plus some kind of spread on top of that. And these mandates depend on the board structure or the governance structure of these plants. Now one, I think, what should take into account factors in, in doing this, and this is a great part of my research, is to think about the underlying determinants of asset returns and also the underlying determinants of the, of the liabilities. And the way to think about this is, I think, a, a, an, a, an analogy with nutrients. A factor is to an asset what a nutrient is to food. And just as we eat different foods, foods provide us with different types of, of nutrients, so too we hold different assets because they give us different factor exposure. These factor exposures could be things like how they co-vary with macro factors like inflation and output, to also how they co-vary with different investment styles <coughs> like value growth, momentum, et cetera. But these are all types of factors. We need to understand those factors in order to find suitable investments for our liabilities. Just as we need to understand the nutrients inside our food to create a balanced diet. Different investors are really different types of people in this analogy. So sovereign wealth funds are just one type of asset manager, and you have many types of asset managers. So <coughs> a, just as a child or woman or man, if you're well or sick, will have different requirements for nutrients, so too a sovereign wealth fund with a particular liability structure will have a different requirement for different factors. So factors are important. You really, really want to look at those factors, and that's, uh, and that's, that's a very important uh, uh, area of research that I, as well as many other, uh, many other academics, are looking at. The final benchmark is a benchmark of long-run equilibrium. And their existence horizon for, long, for sovereign wealth funds is meant to be long-term. Here we're talking generations. The investment horizon, though, could be short or long-term, depending on the makeup of the fund, its risk aversion, and its liabilities. For sovereign wealth funds with long-term investment, as well as existence horizons, those sovereign, in, uh, those sovereign wealth funds benefit immensely from efficient capital markets. As asset owners, they benefit from exercising shareholder rights. So I think the picture here is not all scary. Even though massive amounts of capital, easily projected to be 20 to $25 trillion over the next five to 10 years, are going to be held in these types of vehicles, imagine if all of this money now were to be exercised prudently and appropriately, that they actually exercised their shareholder rights, they created efficiently managed companies. That would be a remarkable transformation. That would be the best, the first best uh, uh, thing that we could, that we could, we could look at with all this capital um, inside these institutions. Here I think the benchmarks help in terms of the political debate of sovereign wealth funds. We want to ensure that the, the, legitim the, the, the fund is legitimate, that this fund is uh, governed correct, uh, appropriately, that this fund sits in the appropriate um, place inside a co uh, an integrated policy perspective, and finally that the fund itself cares about the capital markets and the recipient countries um, of their capital. So if sovereign wealth funds have a long investment horizon, they should consider this long-run external effect that they have. So in conclusion, there are four benchmarks for sovereign wealth funds. I would group them as uh, being, legitimacy, purpose, what their role is in an integrated policy and liability setting, performance, how to structure that optimally in terms of governance, and endurance, which is the long-run equilibrium. Thank you very much.